Thank you, everybody, for coming. Uh, my name is Peter Rich. Um, I, uh, not that it matters, well, it does matter. I was born in 1940 and became interested in bicycle racing about 1954. Um, bicycle racing appeared to, uh, to most Americans to have died uh, about that point in time. When I became interested in bicycle riding, I, I saw no evidence of, of bicycle competition. Um, indeed, uh, well, and then the journalism, part of what this is all about is to try to fill in the middle of a big hole in bicycle history. Uh, probably most people here do know that bicycle racing was the world's, and certainly America's, number one sport. There, were, there was more um, journalistic attention paid to bicycle sport than any other sport. It was the highest paid sport in America, and perhaps uh, six-day racing was the main focus of, of that aspect of sport. And I'm just curious, is there anybody here who does not know what six-day bike races were? As I, as I ask in the general bike community, most people I talk to uh, who are active cyclists these days, they've never heard of it. And, and so we'll, we'll get into that a little bit. But the an objective here is, is that, again, bicycle sport was covered. You, you can go to the libraries and look up um, microfiche, uh, news, news articles, uh, books, uh, magazines. Lots was written about bicycle sport right up to about 1938, 1940. And then it just collapsed. There was, there was no journalistic in, in interest. Partly, obviously, because of the Wall Street crash in 29, the Great Depression, people couldn't afford, th afford things, and then, and then World War II. That was the focus of our Western culture. Um, and it didn't really pick up, even after bicycle sport was, sport was rekindled, um, perhaps by <clears throat> the late 50s, uh, it's the, the news people, people simply did not write about it. Uh, an interesting, to me, interesting example is that I remember I, I used to search the papers and any evidence of bicycle sport. Nowadays, when you watch television or look in magazines, you'll see images of bicycles in some aspect of sport everywhere. You never saw it in, in those years. The, the, there was just no relationship between the well-being of bicycling and uh, the rest of American culture. Finally, uh, uh, perhaps in the late 60s, then some journalism did, did, did get going. But what we're here to do today is to try to fill in the blanks about what really was going on. And when I sent out the, the invitations or the summaries of what I had anticipated doing, I sent it first off to um, about 40, 50 people who I knew were old enough to have witnessed it there. Um, <laughs> I, mean, I had hundreds of interesting phone calls with people, most of whom simply can't come because they just cannot or do not travel anymore. Um, but we, we do have some who can testify to, to that which happened then. And then obviously, so, so there, there's, a blank, there's a blank of time, maybe 20 years of time that we're hoping we, we, we can recover. Um, I, one little piece of that is I do remember uh, there used to be a, a columnist. I don't know if he was syndicated, but he was certainly in the San Francisco Chronicle by the name of Stanton Delaplane. Mm -hmm. and, and I remember once reading a, a column that he wrote wherein he mentioned having a paid a vacation visit to Italy, and he just stumbled onto a Finnish day of the tour of Italy, and he wrote at length about that. And, and I always wondered, why, why he only? I mean, why don't others write about it? Well, he was then about 75 years old, which means that 30, 40 years ago, he was up and running and knew all about six-day bike racing, but all the other journalists were simply too young. It was not within their experience to, to, to relate. Even if they saw a race, they wouldn't know what to say about it. Um, it, it happens that I have a book here, and you're, you're welcome to look through the scrapbooks and books here. One book I have is a book entitled The Story of the Olympics, written in 1948 about Olympic Games up till then. It does not mention cycling as, as a sport. It was simply off the radar of everybody who was writing about sport in, in those years. Um, I had a friend years ago who passed away just a couple years ago, named Lynn Marshall, who 
uh, was when I'm, I was 15, he was then about a 22-year-old graduate student at Cal in history, and I remember that later his uh, specialty became Jacksonian democracy, and on a bike ride one day with him, I naively asked, why so much focus on Andrew Jackson? Haven't there been hundreds of books written about him already? And he gave me a little lecture about how when you read history, history books are often written with a political agenda. The authors write what they think their school communities are going to want to hear, not necessarily what really happened. And, and what they wrote was a second or third uh, generation to them. It was, and that's when I first became aware of the term primary source. He said, you have to go to the primary source. You have to go to the people who are really there and ask them what happens. Well, how do you find Andrew Jackson's primary source? He said, well, you look at his diary. You look at his wife's diary. You look at his brother's diary. Uh, and then you read the letters. That tells you what really happened. What other books relate about Andrew Jackson are not necessarily credible. What we hope to do today is to get primary source information about what really was going on in those years. And I will say that I've already, just since yesterday, been corrected on a few pieces of what I thought were fact, which are only close to fact. Um, Lynn Marshall, uh, no, I'm sorry. M most racing, I think, and maybe somebody can correct me, I think when, when one thought of bicycle racing, 1910 to 1930, they're mostly talking about velodromes. There wasn't really much going on or not much publicized <clears throat> about what was going on in road racing. What this country was known for was producing some of the best velodrome riders uh, in the world. Um, that obviously transitioned after the World War was over. Then we thought of Europeans as being the best, the best uh, riders. I need to give thanks to the city of Davis. Um, the city manager's office uh, generously offered this room which I think is the perfect venue. Uh, I'd like to thank the United States Bicycle Hall of Fame, and, and I have to make it clear that I can't hold them responsible for any um, <laughs> flaws in what we're doing here. Uh, th this is not officially a Hall of Fame activity, but it's on the same day, the same facility, and, and yes, indeed, many of the individuals individually have helped me put this together. I, I would hope that uh, anybody here might consider if you have any old bicycles, uh, photos, scrapbooks that you donated to the museum program, which is um, still evolving and I think looking wonderful. Um, is Joe Hergett here today? The U U.S. Bicycle Hall of Fame really did not have a single, pre I mean, they had a president, but they didn't have anybody who was the full-time paid committed workhorse to organize. Joe Hergett has been in position as the executive director now for only a few months, and he's done a wonderful job of, of picking up those loose ends. Uh, Robert Schultz maybe is over there. He's the uh, technical guy who made the comment to us about microphones. Um, uh, David Takamoto Wirtz is over there in the corner by the door. Uh, he is a University of California Davis um, bicycle transportation coordinator, is that correct? Uh-huh. Um, Andrew Ritchie, who is sitting um, oh, there, um, has uh, collated a number of photographs that people volunteered and to a PowerPoint display, which a uh, uh, slideshow sort of thing. Do they still use that word slideshow? I don't know. Um, <laughs> I've, I've, I've asked Owen Mulholland to um, uh, <laughs> I, I think, I'm hoping that a thousand points of information will be referred to, but that there will not be time to completely uh, identify or describe or follow through on those points. And so I've asked, even though this is all being uh, videotaped, audio taped, um, there will be points that uh, might get lost in the conversation. And I've asked Andrew, uh, Andrew Owen to, um, just start making notes about things that we then may want to follow up with. Um, uh, cell phones, please, if you must answer cell phones, maybe you can uh, sit by the door and get outside so that's not an interruption. Toilets, um, this building has toilets. Um, the immediate right, uh, go out the door and, and make a left turn, that's, that's the handiest. There's coffee for those who wish, just outside the door anytime. Um, the, the, the major program for the weekend is not us. It is the bicycle, United States Bicycle Hall of Fame annual 
induction uh, banquet, and that's, uh, that's at Freeborn Hall. Uh, it may or may not be that if you haven't signed up, it may be that uh, tickets are yet available to that. I'm not sure. Uh, well, we'll find out. Uh, and Freeborn Hall is only a, a couple of blocks, what, three blocks uh, across campus from here? Um, everything is everything happens here is close the motels the museum um, uh, moving on um, in those years w when I was racing and, and what years were those uh, 54 to 64 the, the, the standard of, of competition was pretty low in, in America the, 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 the highest aspiration one had was to beat your teammate or beat the guy in the next city who was winning races and to make the Olympic team. That's where it seemed to stop. Most Americans who were very competitive, aspired to nothing bigger than making the team. There was almost no thought to, to winning a medal. We just weren't that good in, in those years. Um, I'm going to take a minute to just describe what the nationals were. Um, writers today I find it hard to believe that from 1921 to 1964, once a year was held an event called the Nationals. It was a weekend of two events on the track, if there was a track. Turned it off. Uh -oh. um, if for the seniors, uh, most years, it, it was essentially an omnium. Anybody not know what an omnium is? Omnium is uh, a tr usually a track event in which there are, I don't know, anywhere from three to six events, and you get points for first through fifth, however well you do in each event, and the person who comes out at the end of the day or weekend with the highest number of points is the winner of the Omnium. The national championships was an Omnium. For seniors, it was a one-mile, two-mile, five-mile, and ten-mile point race. There were a few years where it deviated. There was one or two years where the 10 mile was in fact a 25 mile. But usually one, two, five, and 10 miles for seniors. And as far as I can tell, always for the juniors, it was uh, one half mile, one, two, and, and five miles. And that was the only form of national championships. A, a road championships was simply not a consideration. The Olympic events, a match sprint, uh, a kilometer, individual or team pursuit, um, uh, missing out, those, those were not even thought of as being part of the national. The nationals, the word the nationals simply defined those four event, that four event weekend. There were, there were district championships, um, and, and in those years, in the late 50s, there were very few districts. As I recall, there were only about nine districts. That is, uh, th there, were, there were representatives from only about 15 states in, in America at all. All the other states simply had no bicycle competition. That's, that's how far off it fell. Um, a whole list of other subjects we can get into, but I think now I should stop and let Andrew proceed with his uh, photo exhibit. Yep. Andrew Ritchie, thank you. Andrew, I, I um, right. should have mentioned that uh, some of us are over 50 and, uh, and, and don't hear so well. <laughs> we need help. Okay, is that better? All right, very good. Um, what you're going to see, um, which I, and I will try and breeze through the slides, through the pictures, um, primary source documentation, photography, of course, very, very important and some um, race programs and adverts and things like that that I've assembled. It's been a very quick process of pulling this stuff together. So there's no kind of system, systematic organization to it. Um, I, I have put the images onto a CD. I can provide anybody with a PowerPoint CD um, <coughs> if you would talk to me afterwards. And now I feel as if I just have to breeze through these because these images because I know that the panelists want to um, want to get going and I don't want them to get impatient. But nevertheless, the photographs really do set the scene for uh, the, the topic and the subject. So, if um, <coughs> I've got identifications for many of the people in the images, 
Um, it, it, I think I probably won't be able to give them uh, because of time considerations, constraints, but um, I'll try and fill you into the context of each image very briefly, date, where, people involved, um, and hopefully that will set the scene for the panelists and the subsequent discussion. So um, I'm just going to go. If we could have the lights slightly dimmed, that would be really helpful. And if I'm in anybody's way, I'll probably just sit down and talk with the microphone. <coughs> yeah, if you could bring the lights down, that would be really good. Can everybody see all right from where you are? Um, would it be better to have the lights a little further down? Anyway, I'll get started. Um, Berkeley Wheelman, about 1956, at Say the Gate on the UC Berkeley campus. Um, Peter Rich, fourth from left. Um, and the, the identities of the other people, Larry Marshall, Paul Higley, Peter Mole, Peter Rich, Bill Prettykin, Ron Ruby, Bob Marshall, Lincoln, Axe, Paul, somebody. North American Championships, Vancouver. Peter Rich on the left, uh, Luis Zanetta, N. Kendall. 1951 State Championships, San Francisco Polo Fields, track bikes. San Diego, 1959, Tim Kelly, Peter Rich, Fred Ranger Renga, Bob Parsons. Championships, Vancouver, 1958, Jack Hartman, Nick Van Mael. I should add that uh, the source for these pictures has been my collection, Peter Rich's collection. Um, we had uh, Bobby Kemp, Ted Ernst, and Erwin Pesek, who all contributed. Um, I think that's my cell phone, never worry. <coughs> um, Ed Lynch, a 1936 Olympian. Don Peterson, about 1952. Uh, no ID on the track. Looks like a plywood track. 53 at the board track. It's Burbank, okay. 53. The, these are the kinds of things that can be debated and discussed later. Lake Merced, September 1957. Best, Van Mael, Brandt, Hartman, Marshall. The beginnings of modern road racing there. Uh, 1951 state championships, San Francisco polo fields. Big crowd, good crowd. Berkeley Hills road race, about 1959. Jobst, Brandt at front, Rich Bronson, Bruce Thompson on motorbike. I have to say most of this information, of course, comes from the back of photographs. And as, as a historian, one of the things that's most frustrating is when you have material where photos have been stuck into books and you're deprived of the information that's on the back of the photographs very often. So please, please, please never stick photographs into a book. Uh, no information whatsoever about this photo. Dave Rose. San Francisco Polo Fields, 1956. Rick Tan, Peter Rich, Bob Best. What a handsome young lad he was. What a change. Huh? <laughs> never let you forget that either. <laughs> um, San Francisco Polo Fields, about 1957. Nick Van Mael. Bob Best, Gus Gatto. Pacific Coast Highway, about 1959, unknown event. Bob Tetzlaff, Peter Locke, Michael Hiltner, Bob Best. And Charlie Allard and his Packard. Okay, that was written on, that was written on the photo too and I didn't write it down. 
Pacific Coast Highway, date unknown. Tom Sparks, Nick Van Mail. Ocean in the background. Tour Del Mar, 1958, left to right. Eric Ness, George Koenig, Tom Sparks, Lars Zabrowski, Rick Bronson. Nineteen forty five Nationals, Chicago, left to right, Ed Schwinn, Ted Smith, Ed Little, Warren Barr, Frank Schwinn. Interesting to see the Schwinn company involved in the championships at that uh, at that point of time, right at the very beginning of our period here, end of the war. Uh, this is an interesting incident about which I know little. Nineteen fifty two visit of Japanese riders to San Jose, possibly to San Francisco too, left to right, Don Peterson, Les Calliamson, Dave Rhodes, Ron Rhodes. Sorry? Okay. So there's a series of pictures of, um, of, this, of this event. I have no idea what, what Korea, I think there was some tie in between the US Navy and the welcome of these Japanese riders, but I have not had a chance to research this. It, excuse me, in, in the Kenosha Wheelman uh, newsletter of those years, it uh, described that th there was an exchange that uh, four riders from the US went to Japan. The following year, four riders from Japan came here. Excellent, okay. So this would have been typical of the kind of lineup for a, a road race on track bikes, presumably if that, the... If that was not heard for the record, that was called the Prince what? Chichibu. Prince Chichibu Trophy. Thank you. So um, still the same event, pretty good crowd. Must have been some publicity to pull out that number of spectators in San Jose. Once again, a really good crowd at the finish. All right, moving on. 1952, San Jose Velodrome, Richie Gatto and Richie O'Brien. Uh, which velodrome exactly that was, I don't know. That, that, that had to be Burbank, the, uh, in San Jose Burbank. San Jose Burbank, okay. The Rhodes brothers, Dave and Ronnie. Uh, and one of them is wearing a US Navy shirt, which should tell us something. I'm not quite sure what. <laughs> now this is, this is uh, right at the very beginning of our period. Um, in fact, before it, 1933, Danish American Cycle Club uh, uh, supplied by Ted Ernst, uh, St. Charles to Chicago road race. So a rather, a rather um, outside the period picture, but um, before the war. This is Norwood Park, Illinois, 1953 scratch race. Once again, track bikes on the road. A cover of bicycling, January 1940. Six ABLA publication, volume one, number 10. So I'm assuming that the ABLA publication started off immediately after the end of the war, since this is number 10 and it's monthly. Uh, a Xerox of Chicago 47th International Six Day Bike Race, 1948, International Am Amphitheater, Chicago. That was sent to it. That was sent to us, but Erwin, Erwin Pesek sent that Erwin to Erwin Pesek, us. yeah, yeah. And he sent, me a, a, sent us another a series of um, Xeroxes of pictures of him racing in six day. Okay. Um, this is Dal, um, D 
Dan Kaljan, Oscar Juna, San Francisco, August 1956. This is an interesting image that I found in a sale of paper goods. Bob Brown's annual 30-mile road race, Berkeley, California, 1947. And for a historian, the back of this picture was kind of a dream because here you have all the riders actually labeled and identified on the back of the picture. Not very often you find such a meticulously documented photograph. Um, ABLA Championship Program 1958. Uh, there's a series of these ABLA Championship Programs, several of which I've seen now. Uh, this is a, just a, a, a photo that's in my collection that I, uh, I found somewhere, ABLA 1958 National Champions that was put out, I guess, as a souvenir or publicity. Inside page of that same ABLA championship showing winners of the championships between 1945 and 1955. The front of Otto Eisler's Cycling Almanac, 1953, to show that cycling was receiving, on a small scale, that kind of uh, attention. Cycling Almanac, 1954. Uh, one of the first publications uh, from the beginning of modern road racing uh, Northern California Cycling Association newsletter, September 1963. And interestingly, in that publication, here we have information about bicycle clubs in Northern California. Those were presumably the clubs that existed at that point of time. And you see how very, very few clubs there are. They, they would have been uh, members of the NCCA. So, almost to the modern era here. This is the picture I was talking about, Owen. Here, here's Owen Mulholland, um, uh, one, two, three, third from left. And here we can see, the sh this is kind of where I come into cycling, 1959, 1960. My first Tour de France was Charlie Gaulle, 1958. So, here we're about 1963. And, of course, no more track bikes on the road, all 10 speeds, MAFAC brakes, the whole the whole deal. Once again, Northern California road racing, uh, early 60s. These pictures were provided by Steve Hammond, who has a wonderful collection. Uh, uh, Nevada City, about the same period. Oh, that's not Nevada City? Oh, my mistake. Okay. I thought it was Nevada City. Where is it? Folsom? Okay. Sorry about that. Bob Tetzlaff early 60s, who's present here somewhere. <laughs> looking, looking, looking so stylish, just like the Belgian riders who, who I admired in the Tour de France booklets. Um, this is a fantastic picture provided by uh, Bobby Kemp. Um, Village Cycles, Los Angeles, 1950s. Bob Tatzlaff, uh, second from right, uh, Charlie Morton next to him, Bobby Kemp in beret. I think he, he's either the one sitting, he must be the one sitting, yeah. This is kind of like, uh, this kind of epitomizes cycling for me. You know, it's the camaraderie and the, uh, all that. Flying Saucer Bike Racing, Burbank Velodrome, 1953, front of a program inside of the program uh, showing the institutional structure of uh, track racing in, at that point. Race officials, very important. Uh, Charlie Morton and Bobby Kemp. Kemp is apparently only 14 in this picture. And Charlie Morton had apparently taken him under his wing and Kemp was apparently earning his living as a professional at the age of 14, hard to believe. Jacques Tati, um, with his wonderful picture, with his bicycle disassembled, uh, looking uh, mysterious and puzzled. Uh, anyway, that's it. So I can, I can provide a CD with these images to anybody who's interested. 
and be happy to do so. And I guess I'll um, uh, sign off and start the questioning and back to Peter. Thank you, Andrew. A little trivia explanation. For years, I was always confused about the term the Burbank Velodrome. Why did I hear it applied to two different places? Well, it was two different places. In uh, San Jose, there's a Burbank district in which, in 1936, uh, part of the w work reconstruction, the FDR WPA program, built a velodrome uh, in the Burbank district of San Jose. The same year, they likewise uh, built a velodrome in Chicago. But not to be confused that in the, in the town of Burbank, there was a different velodrome, also called the Burbank Velodrome. The one in San Jose also was alternately called the, uh, the San Jose Velodrome or the Garden City Velodrome. Um, we should move on. I, I think since uh, Ernie Subert is sitting next to me, um, and since his uh, recollections go back further than any of the rest of us, I'll turn it over to Ernie. Green, green buttons on. Um, are there any in the audience that competed in the 1940s I wanted to see who was as old as I. I just wanted to see who was as old as I was. So, <laughs> Ted, Ted, okay. 1940. Okay, so there's a few. Uh, I'm from the East. Uh, my accent sort of gives me away sometimes. Can't help that. But uh, uh, I started racing in 1944 after my brother Henry went into the, into the Navy, World War II. And uh, I can't tell you too much about 44, because you're in a situation, you're given a bicycle, which was my brother's, the one I started on, until I got my own eventually. Uh, and the tires were hanging in the living room uh, or bedroom, which he left for me when he went into service. And uh, I became, I was, or told to become a member of the German Bicycle Sport Club, which was one of the uh, clubs that was formed in 1927. And the only thing really that's significant is the clubs that existed at that time. I can recall clubs like the, um, uh, and they were ethnic to some degree, uh, German club, the uh, Union Sportiva Italiano, uh, USI. I always thought it was US Route 1. But, um, and of course, there was a French sporting club and a few other clubs. Uh, the big ones in the area were Century Road Club Association and the Long Island Wheelman. And in New Jersey, uh, uh, I always recalled the, the other Century Club of America and the Somerset Wheelman, which was formed by, uh, I believe, Pop Kugler at that time. And that was our experience uh, with clubs. And there were many other clubs, Acme Wheelman, uh, Belleville Bike Club, Triangle Sport Club, but they all faded away as the years uh, progressed. And, but the, the, the important thing is that we had the clubs and we always had the individual, in each club there was an individual that helped the new uh, athletes that came on a scene. And I think that was similar throughout the United States, if I'm not mistaken. There was always that one individual. And who they are, I can't remember. That was so many years ago. Uh, but our activities, we had very few what we called open competitions at that time and a lot of club events. And uh, this is how people got started and uh, developed themselves. So that was the story in the East. We competed in New York, New Jersey, occasionally Pennsylvania, and occasionally uh, the New England states, uh, traveling, 
there was much to travel. I recall going out to Illinois once with, uh, in fact, I think I stayed at Ted Ernst's house <laughs> at that time. That's how far back uh, we go. And the competition was very good. Uh, I, I was fortunate enough to get second place in the junior nationals and uh, and the promote the sponsors of that organization that championship were the Schwinn Bicycle Comp Company, which you referred to, and of course the Bicycle Institute of America, which was an organization headed by at that time John Auerbach. And uh, they donated uh, trophies and some funds uh, for various activities. And I th believe the Schwinn Company at that time was really one of the few, if not the only one, that, r that was uh, sponsoring, uh, giving stuff for the uh, racing uh, people. Um, and, of course, as we progressed, uh, you started to travel a bit more, and the competition, of course, increased, uh, activity increased, and uh, it was only in my later years that I got to travel the country in various capacities with the Amateur Bicycle League of America. Then, which then became U.S. Cycling Federation, now is USA Cycling, uh, and so forth. But at that time, we had a limited uh, number of competitors, and like everything else, you had factions, uh, political factions. Uh, you had this group, you had that group, and many of us, some of us still recall what happened, and. Uh, what happened, happened. But these individuals also kept the sport alive in a period of time where there was nothing else going on. And I always admired that. And for some reason, when I stopped, uh, I could never figure this out. For some reason, when I stopped com competing, I maintained an interest in the sport first with the Eastern Cycling Federation, which was the accumulation of Eastern clubs, and uh, the getting on a board of directors, where I stayed for a good number of years, with the Amateur Bicycle League of America. And uh, I'm, I'm trying to keep things in the 1940s and 50s, and uh, also the 60s. I, as I said, I stopped competing in 56, or 57, I believe, because I, I recall getting married, I still recall that, the first marriage, in 55. <laughs> <laughs> and for some reason, I had an excellent year in 56, so I thought there was something to getting married. <laughs> and then uh, in 57, uh, 58, uh, we were out training, and I took a bad spill in training, and. In fact, the former national junior champion, Jimmy Donovan, fell in front of me in training, and uh, I broke bones on both sides of me, and I had to drink my cocktails and beer through a straw. <laughs> so that was kind of difficult. But uh, at that time, I, I was employed. We all had jobs. And uh, <laughs> my boss said, Ernie, I mean, you think it's about time you stop this nonsense, riding bicycles? And of course, I started a family at that time, and it was a low in what my involvement in things, but uh, I did stay involved in the sport. And uh, here I am. You're stuck with me yet, so. <laughs> that's about, that's a, that's a summary, uh, but the East was like, what you had out here, uh, and the Midwest. There was the East, there was the Chicago, Michigan area, there was the California area. Uh, there was nothing in the Southeast to speak of. There was even nothing in Texas, which is now a big, a large uh, uh, base of cycling. New England had a few, and that's about all I can recall about those early days excepting when I
placed second in the Nationals in 51, people came up to me and said, geez, too bad you didn't win that 10-mile race. I tied for that point race, and uh, I won a five. And an individual by the name of Gus Gatto won a one and a two. And I said, I'm thankful that I did not win the 10-mile point race because I would have had to ride a match race against Gus Gatto. <laughs> And I could not visualize doing that. Do you have any questions? <laughs> During those ABL years, there were uh, obviously a board of directors, uh, large funding, huge salaries were paid to these guys. <laughs> or maybe it was zero. Um, <laughs> I think zero was the answer. And uh, a lot of us found reason to be critical of the ABL at times, but you can't forget that they were all donating their time, probably most of their travel expenses. So it was a huge generosity that they gave to the sport in, in those years. It wasn't really until the U.S. Cycling Federation came along and there was actually a budget and now there were paid administrators. Um, I'll add on to what Ernie said about the, the lowland cycling, I mentioned that when I was a kid, I, I didn't see any evidence of cycling. I one day happened to be riding my bicycle on my three speed, my three to nine speed converted. And I was pretty sure on that day that I was the fastest bicycle rider in the world because nobody had ever passed me. But then one day a guy passed me and he, he turned out to be a, a graduate student from Finland who was riding an eight speed uh, Italian bicycle. I followed him to his dormitory where he told me two days later he was going back to Finland and I, I bought his eight-speed bicycle. I was so excited and um, then I started taking the ferry boat to San Francisco uh, on a, at least once a week uh, to go ride in Golden Gate Park and one day I was riding again thinking there was nobody else out there who did this sort of thing. I was riding up the main drive and about uh, five or six bike riders passed me again, and I think Steve Pfeiffer was among them, Dave Staub, Bill and Bob Best, I think Ina Rootsy, and, and they, they stopped. They circled back, and they came up alongside of me and said, who are you, and what do you do with your bike? <laughs> and um, I mean, that's how rare it was. You saw somebody else on a bicycle with your ears, you wanted to be their friend, and they wanted to be your friend. Um, and so they told me that um, there were actually were races around Lake Merced in San Francisco, they gave me the phone number for Nick Van Mayle, who lived in Richmond at the time, who had a car, and uh, probably transported me to 20 or 30 races over the next year or two. Um, even after that, when, when we finally did have clubs organized, the, the numbers of clubs started growing exponentially soon thereafter. But when we went out on training rides, we, we were just, we were chased off the road so frequently. It was not at all unusual. In fact, it was almost the rule that if you went on a 50 mile ride, somebody would throw a banana peel or a beer can at you because the American public generally felt that they were entitled and only they were entitled to use the roads, that adults should not be seen on bicycles. There was a very negative connotation that they did not know any of the cycling sport history. They did not know any of the health advantages. They saw no reason that bicycle riders sh should, should be allowed to share the road. Um, 